Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Bellingham City Council afternoon sessions of May 4th. We will start this afternoon with um, community, community and Economic Development and Michael Ilk was the chair. Thanks, Gene. Uh, we actually have a pretty full schedule. I think there's four items. Yes, four items before our committee. Joining me in the committee are council members um, Vargas and Murphy. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, the first item is a resolution authorizing the 2015 HUD action, annual action plan. This action plan we've been doing for a number of years to satisfy uh, our um, reporting requirements on our federal grants. But to that, we've now added the Bellingham housing levies. It was actually a much larger action plan than the past years. And shall I go ahead and start off with you, Mr. Stahlheim? Sure. Thank you. Uh, David Stahlheim, uh, Planning Community Development and Block Grant Manager. Uh, so we are here to talk about the 2015 Annual Action Plan. Uh, first off, I kind of want to walk through a few things that are, I think that are the needs that drive the action in the plan coming out of our 2013 and 2017 consolidated plan. First is uh, looking at the population of Bellingham. And um, one of the things that's really uh, uh, can be identified is the aging, the baby boomers. And so as you look at 2000 data here in blue and the uh, red is the baby boomers you see is that getting up uh, uh, moving up and in the next 20 years they'll continue to be moving up and so one of the major issues that we're going to be facing I think in this community is the aging of our population At the same time we have this very unique thing that's not uh, true of many towns and that's reflective of a college town we have very many young people that's disproportionate to a normal population the actual numbers of elderly, as you can see, between 2000 and 2010, for 60 plus, uh, has increased significantly, those numbers uh, in Bellingham. And it's really good that uh, we'll present a project today that we have a senior housing project on our agenda. Also, as, uh, as you know, as you're dealing with other things, our housing tenure is different. It's very different than the rest of Whatcom County in Bellingham. Uh, 55% of the housing units are renter-occupied versus owner-occupied. And our vacancy rates are decreasing while our rents are increasing. Uh, this is a trend that uh, some of the data from uh, the University of uh, the Runstead Center is showing a little bit of increase uh, or, or decrease actually in the uh, uh, vacancy rate um, that's going on. I don't think that's really necessarily totally accurate of the whole portfolio of things, but you can clearly see is that the average rent is increasing and we are having vacancy issues that are driving our housing issues in the community. Our households are cost burden. Those that are paying more than 50% of their income uh, for housing is very significant. When you look at particularly those that earn less than 30% of the median family income of how many households um, here, these are the renter households, uh, 4,200 renter households that are very, very low income, extremely low income, that are paying more than 50% of their income. And this also is reflective in the elderly, the elderly 405 households um, that are renters that are paying more than 50% of their income on housing costs. And so these are significant issues. And of course, not everyone actually has a home. Uh, the 2014 point in time count showed that there's 553 people without a, a home. Of that, 32% uh, the day of the count were living on the street in a tent uh, without any kind of shelter whatsoever. So when we look at the 2015 action plan, uh, the first part is to recognize the continu continuation of our commitments that we've already made. And so I'll run through a list of the projects that are there. When we look at production and rental housing, um, we have two projects with Catholic Housing Services, Francis Place, which is due to be complete uh, this summer, July of 2015, and a new project, Bakerview Family Housing, Farm Worker Housing, uh, which just uh, is getting its building permits right now, and I know that Steve Powers with Catholic Housing Services, I saw him, is here, and uh, he's a local manager of the housing uh, uh, units in uh, Bellingham, uh, in Whatcom County and Skagit County, I believe. Also, Northwest Youth Services, we started the commitment to uh, fund development of their project on vacant property for young adult housing. Uh, this last year, and we're going to continue that commitment into the next year's plan. Uh, preservation of existing housing, we made a lot of commitments uh, dating back to 2013. Uh, Dorothy Place, 
uh, the YWCA, Larrabee renovation, Lydia Place, uh, manufactured home program we have funded all the way through 2019. The city of Bellingham has been doing a homeowner rehabilitation program since 1977. And we also set aside $50,000 a year in uh, emergency repair for very low income housing and shelters. We had a uh, couple projects that uh, we approved uh, in years past um, that are still on the agenda to get finished here this year. Uh, Opportunity Council, their uh, service center uh, is due to be complete this fall. And then Bridget Collins, we're doing some accessibility improvements for the Family Support Center, which will be due to be done at the end of this year. Home buyer program, we have two uh, projects with Culture and Community Land Trust. One is a scattered site acquisition rehab program. Uh, we have uh, 13 units committed and five of them have been completed so far. And we have Culture Community Land Trust, their uh, senior housing project that they're doing down uh, called Mackenzie Green Commons. And uh, that's due to get started this summer and to be completed uh, summer of next year. So the second part of the 2015 action plan are the new commitments that we're making as part of this program. Uh, in the rental housing production, we have three new applications. Uh, from Mercy Housing Northwest, and we have Joan Latushi from uh, Mercy Housing Northwest uh, is here. We have Pioneer Human Services, uh, Joe Nagel, uh, who's a local person that works on the uh, CityGate project, uh, is here representing Northwest Youth Services, and I don't know if anyone made it here from Northwest. I think Rhiannon's on vacation, so. Of these three new projects, we got 140 units that would be created. Um, 75 of the units would serve people at 30% area median income or below, 65 units at 50%. Population targets here are seniors, physical disabilities, and frail elderly, and that's the Mercy Housing Project called Eleanor Apartments. Um, we have veterans. Uh, uh, Pioneer Human Services would dedicate some of their units to veterans. And we have uh, homeless at entry, and so Pioneer Human Services and Northwest Youth Services both would have uh, homeless units and we would be creating 18 units. So we have a little over $3.7 million reserve, plus we are uh, proposing to de dedicate operating assistance to Pioneer Human Services project uh, for five years of uh, $588,465. In addition to these three applications, we're also reserving uh, $1,125,000 to supplement the Acquisition Opportunity Fund. Uh, so that would get up to a total of $2 million for us to potentially acquire property within the community that could be used for uh, low-income housing in the future. Preservation of housing, we have uh, two applications that uh, came in and we're both funding. Is One is for Interfaith Coalition, and I don't know if anyone from Interfaith got here, Laura. Uh, and then DV SAS, I think uh, Jen is here from DV SAS, and uh, this is for the uh, women care, or what was used to be called women care shelter. I'm falling into that trap too. It's called the safe shelter, uh, formerly known as women care shelter. Uh, we would have 25 units there, uh, all serving 30% of very median income or below. The population targets are victims of domestic violence in the safe shelter. And uh, Interface Project is for homeless families. There's four units. And they're actually managed by the Opportunity Council. $243,515 reserved out of levy and community development block grant funds. In our Public Facilities and Improvements Program, we have three new applications. Uh, one from Interfaith Community Health Center, and we have Gib is here uh, in the front row. Um, uh, Interfaith is going to do a new dental clinic at their 1616 Cornwall property. Um, this is uh, a new opportunity that uh, uh, is coming about partly because of income streams that they get to um, help, help pay for the operating costs for this. And so we're doing the capital side of this to help them uh, get this established. Then we had the Whatcom Family and Community Network submitted two applications. Um, and one would be a new family resource center at Shuxon Middle School. And I know that Steve Morris from the school district is here and April Barker from uh, the Birchwood neighborhood are both here uh, to help support this new family resource center at Shuxon Middle School. We also have a renovated uh, neighborhood resource center in the Roosevelt neighborhood. And uh, that's actually on Bellingham Housing Authority property. 
and uh, Brian Thane is, uh, I saw Brian walk in somewhere up here, so. So $340,664 reserved out of block grant funds. Okay, turning to our services program, um, we have eight applications that are recommended for funding. Uh, there are six uh, agencies, Catholic Community Services, Lydia Place has two activities, Northwest Youth Services, two activities, Opportunity Council, DV SAS, and the YWCA. A total of $275,000 is reserved, 100,000 of that is block grant, and the remaining is through the housing levy. In our human and social services program, we have 16 applications that are recommended for funding. It covers a lot of different areas from child care, intensive case management, uh, food, disability benefits, uh, support services, uh, literacy, uh, chore program, uh, domestic violence and restorative justice programs. Total of $361,110 is reserved for that, uh, of which $47,000 is block grant and the remaining being city general fund dollars. So as we go through all those those projects, it's, it's good to remember a little bit or get some context to the funding sources of what's paying for all this. Um, this graph is much different than it was in previous years. 74% of the funding for all these activities is coming out of the housing levy. So two years ago that was there was no funds that were locally generated for that purpose other than the city general fund. As you can see, uh, block grant is 11% and the home fund's 11%, so about 22% coming from HUD. As we look at these commitments, uh, it's also important to recognize what's left uh, to be committed, so we have quite a bit of uh, funds that are left to be committed. Uh, when we look at the production and preservation of, of homes program, we have over $4 million that's left to represent new capacity um, uh, to be committed here, plus the $2 million that we have in the acquisition and opportunity fund. So really we have $6 million, um, over $6 million right here. And then existing housing, this is uh, for new commitments, this would be preservation of housing. When you look at the rental assistance support services funds, this is only the ongoing program, so we talked about the housing services, $175,000 a year out of the housing levy. That really consumes all of those dollars uh, to the end of the levy, and we'll, I'll show you another graph on that. Home buyer program, we got over $683,000 left to commit there, and then the acquisition opportunity fund, eight seventy-five dollars plus, uh, as I mentioned, we set aside some funds here. So one of the issues that's coming up, uh, and nothing to do right now, but I just want to give you a little bit more heads up to the conversation that needs to be had, is the funding in our Rental Assistance Support Services Fund. Uh, the budget that we had is in the red uh, bars, but the commitments that we had is, is here, in, and this is the project-based rental assistance. So these are dollars that we marry between a new project coming online and the operating funds that are needed to make that uh, a viable project. So, for example, a homeless housing project, if people have no income, there's still, you have to pay the bill somehow. You still have to keep the electricity, you gotta keep staff. Uh, all those things have to be, uh, still have a revenue source. So to help support these projects that don't have an income stream to them, we need to probably help support that. And so project-based rental assistance is funding that we tie directly to a new project coming online. And those dollars are now fully committed with the Pioneer Human Services Project. Uh, Northwest Youth Services Project uh, will need that and I anticipate one or two other projects in the next couple of years will come online uh, as we go back to this, this dollar amount again. Of all the projects that will come online, several of them will need some help in operating costs. And so we need to come back and have a conversation about potentially moving some dollars to help support those projects as they come forward. So one of the neat things about looking at uh, meeting the expectations of, of the levy is that uh, in the production preservation program, we had a seven year goal of producing or preserving 417 units of housing. Uh, before this action plan, we were well on our way. We had 347 units that were under contract and 132 completed. After this uh, action, we actually are now surpassing our goal. We're at 417 units 
472 units that would be under contract. And so um, we're doing um, really well. And it looks like I didn't change this. So we got 75 units. I counted something. Um, it didn't go backwards. I forgot to edit that graph. I apologize for that. Um, we're also making the commitment of leveraging city funds um, with, with the dollars. As you see in these new commitments, uh, it varies by program, but overall for every dollar of city funding, we're leveraging another $8.14 of other funding that comes in as part of this program. So some of the future needs and discussion we have, uh, first off, we need to have the housing, Washington State Housing Trust Fund funded. Um, we have fairly good appropriations on the Senate and the House side, uh, better in the House budget, but three of our projects that are on this list uh, also are seeking uh, Washington State Housing Trust Fund dollars. And so it's really essential that we uh, get that funded and we get those projects there. We should be in good shape because we got uh, the projects selected. We'll let them know that they're our top priorities and, and hopefully we'll get it funded uh, and off we go. Off, I've already mentioned the operating rental assistance, coming back and having that conversation. And to help uh, fund some projects, we had originally set aside some additional emergency shelter dollars. And uh, we took that back out because we're studying the, the need for supporting emergency shelter. But once we get done with studying that need, we may come back with uh, some conversation about uh, increasing our support for emergency shelter in our community. So with that, if there's any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Thank you, David. Committee members, Roxanne. Well, I'd just like to simply show my support for each and every one of these organizations by moving that we pass the resolution authorizing the 2015 Housing and Urban Development Annual Action Plan. I'll second that. I'm in approval all the way across the board. Great. So we have a motion and also a second for uh, recommending approval tonight. Is there any further discussion? Most committee members? I just had one request. Uh, could you send us that PowerPoint? There is some additional information that's not in our packet that's in there that's I thought was really great, uh, some really good Certainly. information. Thank you. Yeah. Um, David, I have a question. Um, you were going pretty quickly, and I forgot to write down, couldn't write down it. It has to do with uncommitted money to date for housing production. There's $4 million, and then said, and that's also in addition to the $2 million what? Does that have to do with that strategic money set aside for acquisitions? I'm trying to figure out what it, it does. Is. Yeah, so I'll uh, pop this graph up on the board again. That's the so-called acquisition and opportunity fund. Yeah, so we the original plan was to set aside eight hundred seventy-five thousand dollars in the acquisition opportunity loans. Um, our commitments in this plan add another one million one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. So really, this should grow up to two million dollars. But then the so, and then this is also for future commitments. So the 875, if I looked in the pro proper place, that was committed in earlier years, and we're committing another 1.125 this year. Yeah, the 875,000 was part of the original levy program, so it was set aside at the beginning. So could you describe um, how we might use that approximately $2 million? What kind of opportunities are we looking for? Why do we want to set that aside? What do we imagine we might do with it? Uh, is to whatever opportunity uh, comes up for acquisition of property that might look good for affordable housing. Right now, we have looked at potentially using the Samishway Quarter to acquire property there. So that would be one source of the funding for that. So would these be, could these be acquisitions that the city made or they're just as likely or more likely to be acquisitions some other party is making and then we're helping provide funding? Well, if the city made the acquisition, it would be short-term that we would transfer it because we wouldn't have long-term ownership to it. So if, if the city had to do that, that's possible. Typically, we would um, have another organization that would be the end provider acquire that, and we would provide them with a loan for that. Great. Any further questions from council members? Dan Hamill? Just out of curiosity, um, I do want to see why Northwest Youth Services 22 North project at 250,000 was listed as a set aside as a, a CHOTO or a community housing development organization. Just why it was li listed under that distinction? Yeah, good question. The um, what we want to do is is help them over the next year to do some um, 
planning for that project because it's not quite ready uh, to go forward. Uh, they, they need to kind of develop their full plans and operating budget. And we're allowed to take some of the federal funds. We can take 10% of that community housing development organization and, and spend that on pre-development funding. So uh, we had heard that the need was for $25,000 and so we, we funded the CHODO, the community housing development organization, $250,000 so that we could get 10% of that fund for pre-development funding. So we have to set aside at least 15%, which is roughly 70,000, but we're setting aside more in order to do some pre-development funding there. Thank you. No, I'm good. Thank you very much. Uh, you have a I have another smaller question. For the new rental housing production commitments, you totaled up 140 new units are being committed to this year. We've had great projects. How many people are going to go in those 140 units? Do we like, estimate a person and a half in each unit or two people per unit? Is there a way to translate that to people from units? Uh, it's really hard to say. I mean, Northwest Youth Services will probably be, in large measure, um, singles. Uh, Mercy Housing, I don't know, Joanne, do you have any sense of? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it kind of depends on, on each project um, that's there. And then uh, Pioneer, I think probably everyone is singles in there, so they're all studio units, I believe, yeah. So I imagine so. So in this case, most of these are, are a little bit more towards singles. Okay, studio units. And then finally, um, we have, uh, um, it says here, seven year commitments to help uh, two of the projects um, with project based assistance mm -hmm. services. When, do we, when and how do we make that seven year commitment? I'm not questioning, I just don't, I don't recall that happening or when or how that happened. Yeah, so it, uh, those two projects were two years ago, so that would be for Catholic Housing Services, Francis Place, and then for Sun Community. And so when those projects came online, they asked for uh, operating assistance for seven years as well. Mm -hmm. And so we, um, we do that, we recognize it in every year's action plan, but we, we have a contract for seven years already committing those dollars for them. Okay, so now, if, I, if I had a better memory, I would have remembered from two years ago, we made that commitment as we approved the project, also seven years of this assistance? Correct. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to back up on uh, the number of people per household. I do want to recognize also the project that's about to get started is the farm worker housing project, which will be oriented towards families. So those are larger units, two bedroom and two and three bedroom units, I do believe, uh, the farm worker 50 housing. Units, but 50 units, but many yeah. people per unit. Yeah, so that will be family housing there. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Um, we'll go ahead and take the vote now. Uh, to the, the motion is to recommend approval of the action plan to the full council tonight. All those in favor, signify saying aye. 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 Okay, that'll have a unanimous recommendation tonight. Thank you, Mr. Stahlheim. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is uh, a 1% for the arts ordinance. Uh, Ms. Tara Sundin, the uh, division leader for the community development portion of our planning department, will uh, present this draft ordinance. I, I believe you presented this in concept at our last meeting, and we asked for you to go ahead and put that in ordinance form for the details. So, Ms. Sundin. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, on March 23rd, staff provided council with an overview of a proposal that we made to you to create a 1% for the arts program for Bellingham. Uh, yes, you did direct us to draft that ordinance. Um, it's in your packet. Um, I'm pleased to, to say that it's, I believe, only three pages long. Um, and uh, sometimes that's actually harder than, um, than writing more. So I really want to thank Darby Cowles and Amy Cram for um, providing you with such a tight, clear, and concise ordinance. I also want to thank Shannon Taishi um, of the Planning and Community Development Department. She staffs the Arts Commission, and she has been providing that oversight for a number of years. The Arts Commission has been talking and advocating for the creation of this type of ordinance for a very long time. Um, I've been working with them for about 12 years, and um, it's been discussed um, during that, that entire time. So we also want to appreciate their patience and kind of dedication for keeping this um, at the forefront. So 
Um, while this will, will, will become um, something new for Bellingham, it's certainly not new in concept. Uh, the state of Washington has had a percent for the art program for over 40 years. Um, they have, we have a number of other cities in the state, Tacoma, um, Edmonds, Spokane, the list goes on and on. I think there's over 20 uh, cities that have these programs. Now, while the city hasn't had a percent for the arts program, we certainly are a leader in the arts and we are respected um, in the arts community. We um, have one of the strongest theaters, I think a city our size has in the state, as well as the museum that we do. The city of Bellingham contributes significantly to the arts and in those entities and um, we do through some of our other programs. Our art collection, our outdoor art collection, is about 84 pieces um, that we maintain oversee, and that's part of the role of the Arts Commission, is overseeing those um, either purchases, donations, uh, maintenance, and um, care and feeding of the arts and, and, and our collection. Uh, so with this, their role would expand a bit. So um, the ordinance itself, it's, it's on page, I think, 435 of your packet. It is very simple and straightforward. Um, it is to dedicate 1% of the capital improvement um, projects budget um, to the integration of art into that project. Uh, we have a threshold of $2 million, so the capital project would need to be two million or more, and then this, this would apply. So um, that would be at a $2 million project, we'd be looking at a $20,000 um, kind of budget for the integration of artwork, or it could be a purchase of, of a sculpture. To give you a sense of scale, um, the, we purchased the goat that's outside of um, Depot Market Square for 20,000. So that would be kind of like the minimum kind of, of threshold. And then the sculpture out in front of WTA is more in the range of $65,000 and probably a bit more after engineering costs. Give you a sense of scale. Now, those are sculptures and we would be looking at integrating artwork as well. So it could be instead of just a standard railing that we'd put along a pier, um, we could um, hire an artist to to design something kind of above and beyond that standard, and that above and beyond um, piece would be the, the percent for the arts component. Uh, there are a few exemptions, so of course, if something's less than two million, it's not applying. Um, if the public can't see it, so this is all about you know the public enjoying um, the, the projects that we put forth in the community. So if it's underground, if Ted's replacing, you know, sewer lines or building out sewer systems, we're not applying this this percent for the art program to that. So if it's not visible, it's also exempt. Um, <laughs> he has plenty of things that are visible, um, and I do want to say, you know, we have done projects similar to this. Um, Bay Street is an example of integrating a lot more than one percent in that case to the to the art. Um, the new roundabout, um, uh, we integrated um, some stone sculpture there. So we do um, do this. This would just be formalizing our commitment to integrating artwork into our projects. Um, if, we, if we receive you know, a grant and that grant says we prohibit you know, the purchase of public art, um, then obviously we would not be able to apply it in that case as well. So that's in, kind of a pretty actually thorough um, <laughs> uh, overview of, of the program that we're presenting to you. The details about how we're purchasing and procuring artwork and you know, that during process, that will be um, outlined in a policies and procedures document that we have for the, the Arts Commission. And so if this um, proposal does um, move forward and the ordinance is approved, then we will need to modify those policies and procedures um, to integrate this particular percent for the arts program, and we would do that as a next step. 
So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Tara. Uh, committee, uh, yes, Roxanne. So I'm just hoping in the long term we can go after different grant dollars or any kind of funding so that in the future we could hopefully match or even contribute to make the installations even bigger and better and brighter. So just that thought. Councilmember Vargas. Uh, a couple of things. When you first brought this forward, I had asked for uh, if there could be an inclusion that said local. Um, since then, I've had many discussions with both you and the community and realized that um, it's not that simple. Um, and we don't want to limit the things that we can do in our city. So I just wanted to thank you for going down that road with me and uh, being willing to explore it. And obviously, we do want to encourage as many local um, artists and engineers and architects to apply for these things because it, it's better for our economic vitality. Uh, a couple of things. I went to the Art Walk on Friday night and our downtown was packed. And I really feel as though Bellingham is growing so much in regards to the arts community and it's lovely to see. Uh, I think this ordinance is, is fantastic and the more art we can integrate into our community, the better. And I do have a question. Uh, so the Alabama safety corridor that we're about to do, <laughs> does this fall under that or not? Hmm. It's not underground. <laughs> Ted Carlson, Public Works Department. A couple of things with Alabama. One, it is grant funded primarily and that grant is a highway safety grant. And that particular granting source is one of the ones that doesn't, it's not eligible for our work. And the second part of it is a majority of that project is maintenance, half of it at least, which is the resurfacing. So that particular project wouldn't qualify under this ordinance as presented to council. Thank you, I knew that we might get that question, so it's yeah. good to know what the answer is. Yeah. Thank you so much. Other council members? I'll recognize Jack Weiss first, get his hand up, and then Terry will have next turn. Thanks, Michael. Um, I guess it, it's sort of along the lines of what uh, Pinky was doing. Was on, I haven't looked at the capital improvement program since last fall. I don't remember it, but within the next few years, what, what projects are coming up that would qualify for, uh, for this type of a project? I have the list here. So we have the Overwater Walkway, Corp. Cordata Neighborhood Park, Cornwall Beach Park, uh, Mahogany Arctic Arterial, uh, Squalicum Creek Reroute, West Baker View On Ramp, um, let's see, Granary Bloedel. Pretty much any project in the waterfront district is gonna, gonna trigger this. And that's, so that's for the next six years, that's what's on our radar right now. And a, a follow-up question is, uh, out of the 20 other cities that you said that already have this in the state, uh, are, do any of them require private development projects to undergo the same type of uh, contribution? None that I'm aware of. This is just for municipal purchases. Yeah, thanks. Terry? Yeah, I don't have a question. I just, just a comment that, you know, this is something that's been discussed for a long time, and I'm just Glad to see it finally has made it w its way to us, and I'll just be really happy to support this. Our art community is such an important resource to this community, and the more we can do to enhance that, uh, the better. We draw a lot of people that come to see the artwork and, and the artists, the, the the whole area because of that. So this this will just help enhance that and enhance Bellingham's reputation as a destination art area. Councilor Murphy. I move to approve the 1% for the arts ordinance. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second to recommend tonight uh, passing the ordinance, the 1% in the arts ordinance. Uh, I'd like to say, oh, I was gonna say some comment. Oh. Uh, I forgot what I was going to say, so I'm going to let you talk first, so I'll try to remember. <laughs> and then you'll think of it. Yes. Oh, good. Well, this is where we, dredge, we kind of dredge up old names from the past, and when Seth Fleetwood was still on the council and he was deciding that he was going to retire, I asked him, um, okay, what projects are, have, are left undone? What things had you, had you, you know, particularly cared about 
that didn't get finished in your term, and this was one of them. And so I think we all need to thank Seth also for uh, keeping this idea alive, and I know all the council members also supported this, but I figure it's nice to recognize somebody who isn't here anymore, but is still in the community, and so I want to thank Seth. Nice touch. I do remember. I, I was going to say that personally I think good design always includes a attention to the aesthetic element. Incorporating art is one way to do that. But this also isn't something I think outside of what the city has done. We already have a strategic commitment to a sense of place. In other words, we're not just building bridges, we're building, trying to build a community and the infrastructure for a community. So integrating the artistic elements into all the big heavy concrete things that we make, in my mind, goes right into that strategic commitment. There's no further discussion. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 That'll be unanimous recommendation tonight. Thank you very much. And thank you, Seth Fleetwood. The next item on our agenda is a discussion of urban village redevelopment incentives. Uh, again, this was an item which came forward, uh, I think it was just the last meeting, where some ideas were sent in a briefly in outline form. This is a further discussion uh, of those incentives. Uh, Ms. Coles. Thank you, Darby Coles, Planning and Community Development Department. Um, at our last meeting, April 13th, we did present some initial recommendations for incentives to apply for urban villages. And just a reminder, this time we're looking for your direction on which ones to move forward with. We're not actually um, attempting to adopt anything right now, so this will be very helpful um, in our discussions. And some of these may require an ordinance or a public process, and others are administrative. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we do want to get your direction on those, on all of those. Um, the discussion agenda that it begins on page 439 of your packet outlines some questions that arose at that last work session as well as some comments and questions that were received after the fact. So um, it's not comprehensive if there's other things that we need to add. Um, we do have a, a pretty good chunk of time today to work through these. Um, uh, in addition to that, there's the matrix in the packet, which begins on page 444, and that contains the at a glance um, for where staff has has um, started, <laughs> and then after that um, are the more detailed summaries of each incentive, along with a time frame, a recommended time frame, and those details. So, we hope to um, go through each of those today as well. Um, but to start, one of the questions that came up early in our discussion last time was uh, the whole idea of the terminology of urban village and what is it, and um, some confusion about you know why are why are we calling downtown in the city center? So we just wanted to um, kind of highlight where we were coming with that. Does anybody know why this screen doesn't work up over there? Or? Okay, well, that's fine. Oh, okay. <clears throat> it broke down. Uh, so, for, just for discussion purposes, we've been working off the urban village definitions in the existing comp plan. This map uh, was updated, I believe, I think 2009. So, there have been some transitions to this over time, but really it's based from the growth forums that occurred and then adopted in the 2004 version. So in our existing comp plan, it refers to the city center as the core urban village. So that's kind of the, the definition that we've been using. But this is something that as we move forward with the comp plan update, we, it might make sense to take a look at um, what we're calling these things, how, how we're tiering them, um, et cetera. It uh, goes into quite a bit of detail of which ones um, are tiered based on readiness and which ones um, are characterized based on, uh, on their um, current regulations. So just wanted to give a little bit more background context on that. And also, if you have direction or recommendation on making, <laughs> making those changes, that would be helpful to know. Are there any other comments or questions about that? 
so process-wise, it, it sounds like you kind of want to go through each of the major issues and see if there's any sticking points on each one. Okay. Yeah. Any further need to discuss the, the issue of urban village, what we mean by that term? Or I do think it could deserve some clarification. And um, The downtown really is a special case, and I think it needs to be recognized as such. I'm not quite sure how. Okay, let's go on to the next item then. Great. So um, in the last discussion, um, work session, we talked about a number of incentives. Some of them were tax reductions, impact fee credits, and non-financial incentives. And um, these, as far as the limitations go, staff is recommending that we um, continue to offer those in those targeted areas as long as there's a need. So part of moving this project forward will be to really come up with some um, some performance measures that we can periodically bring forward to you. And the, the performance measure idea is similar to what we presented with the objectives for each urban villages, for each urban village. We were looking at how many residential units had been constructed, how much commercial activity had occurred, what's the state of the infrastructure and the opportunities for development. So those and other things we're really gonna wanna track, but we think that we could leave the majority of the incentives that we're recommending in place as we're tracking that evolution. The one that's a little bit um, different is the SDC and permit fee reduction um, because that would require general fund commitment to backfill. So we wanna make sure that we're being um, really clear about uh, what sort of commitment the city would be making. So for the starting point of discussion, staff is suggesting that we um, make an annual commitment of 20, between 20,000 and uh, sorry, $200,000 and $250,000 per year um, based on those example projects that we had looked at for the type of um, development that we're hoping to incentivize, that could support probably one or two of those big projects. Um, and then the idea would be we would offer those on a first come, first serve basis annually for those qualifying projects. And I do wanna talk about that next as far as what that, those qualifying projects might look like. Um, if the funds aren't utilized at the beginning of the program, the idea would be to roll them over and then to offer them the next year. But um, to start the program off with no more than that $250,000 annually, so it would be a maximum million dollar commitment for a five year program. Um, I think we'll be wanting to assess it as we move forward on a more regular basis, but that five year period or the $1 million cap would give us enough time to look and see it if we're um, getting the, the successes that we want. And again, we're only going to be offering them to the, I, the projects that qualify. So I, that part is at the end of the memo, but I think it might be good for us to talk about that now because it is a very key concept. Um, Again, for most of uh, the incentives that we've talked about, multifamily tax exemption, the TIF credit, the um, qualifying projects are outlined in those existing ordinances. So they're very specific to those incentives. Um, for this new idea of offering a, a permit fee or um, system development charge reduction, we would need to establish our, a new qualifying project threshold as part of that. Um, and staff is starting with the um, recommendation for new construction at a minimum of three stories that is um, reflecting and compliant with the goals and policies in the respective sub area plan. So a reminder at this point, because of that limited commitment and the ability to offer it probably to a handful of projects, um, staff is recommending that it only be applied in downtown and old town to begin and then um, the qualifying project at three stories. Sorry, Darby, could you uh, reiterate that again? What was that about the three stories and the... Right, right, for, so for new construction. So um, offering a 50% reduction in those fees in downtown and Old Town would be available, but only for projects that qualified. And for the sake of discussion, our initial recommendation is that those projects must be at least three stories in order to request um, that incentive. I just wanna add on to that. Um, that's for new construction, so three stories for new. Um, but we have two other programs, the multifamily tax exemption program and the special valuation. So we also wanna consider 
projects that qualify, let's say you have a historic, let's say Cascade Laundry, for example. It's a two-story building, but they qualify for special valuation because they're going through that program. We want to consider that one as well. So the renovation of existing structures or multifamily tax exemption um, may go into an, uh, a housing and into a second floor in an old building, something like that. To clarify, the special valuation, that's when you're rehabilitating a historic building. It has to be designated historic in some sense. Okay. Actually, Councilmember Weiss, you had a question? I guess I'm, I'm interested, and in, uh, maybe Eric can, could help out with this, but specifically, what are system development charges uh, paying for? Uh, and the reason why I'm asking the question, I'm, I'm curious as to whether or not developed downtown or other urban village areas that already have their utility infrastructure in place uh, would, you know, they get charged these SDCs. Uh, are they subsidizing areas on the fringe where we actually be, have to basically build new infrastructure? That's a great question. This is Eric Johnston, Public Works, and the SDC charges are, in a, sen in a sense, your fair share of the cost of the system. And so the calculations for the system development charges are based not only on infrastructure that's in place, but infrastructure that is being built to support that infrastructure there. For example, post point in the case of the sewer charges. So when you pay your system development charge, you're paying your fair share of the cost of that construction of that facility or the debt service that the city's incurred to pay for that facility over the long term. So it's not just the pipes in front of your particular piece of property, but the entire system that's needed to support that individual service. In the case of wastewater, it's post point, the pump stations, the conveyances to get it there. In the case of water, it's the water plant to provide water to that individual property. In Bellingham, and this was a conversation that we had quite an extent with the group working on the SDC portions of this, is, is there value in separating one area from another and having a different fee or reduction in that? And on our, our analysis of that says that the SDC should be applied uniformly throughout the city because of the large investments that we have recently made and will be making in the water and wastewater assets. But that was your decision. I, that was me, our it recommendation seems like it's to a, the council. It really is a, it's a policy issue that we really do need to talk about because I personally, you know, bringing up a, a situation like the Cascade Laundry, the building's been there for years. Why should they be paying any more because they want to go and do a rehab on it and they're going to get hit with an SDC um, when they have they have been part of the, the entire system for many, many years. Uh, the, the SDCs, and the SDCs only would, SDCs would only apply if there is a change in the size of the service. And what we do with the SDCs is we credit the existing size of service towards any new impact. So if a, if a building goes from a, a two inch meter to a three inch meter, they would get credit against the size of the existing demand. And the payment would be only for that increase in the demand on the system. So if you if you if an S, if an SDC applies to a project, um, then you pay the difference or the increase. Uh, if there's no increase in demand on the services, then there is no SD, SDC that would be applied at the time of redevelopment. Yeah, I, I still have a problem with it just because you know, like, for instance, the the wastewater treatment plant. A lot of that was based on 2006 projections of what comprehensive growth was going to be. And, you know, I, I think we've, we've bought into a system where we're now we're going to have to go and pay dearly for that uh, beca because we overshot our population projections. I also have a problem with the water. You know, if we're talking about d distribution of water way out in the, you know, in up U Street Road or down Meridian like we have pre previously done, where we put in oversized mains to go and handle places like Kitech, which we'll not, you know, we're not going to go and do, hopefully at least in our lifetime. Everybody's having to pay into that, and I don't see that that buildings or structures in the in the urban villages should have to go and shoulder the cost of that type of development on the outskirts. I, I don't feel like that's a fair policy, and I understand that it was done administratively, but. To me, it seems like you know it might be a, a wise thing to do on a council level to, to really look at that to see if there's a, uh, a more, uh, I think, equitable way of, of being able to distribute those, uh, those costs. And we certainly would welcome that policy discussion. I think that our recommendation is that policy discussion occurs as part of, this, of the rate structure that the city charges as opposed to individual economic development portions. The city council, in, the, in your deliberations as to how rates would be assembled, 
could make a choice to, to charge SDCs or not charge SDCs. The goal of the city council, the goal of the, of the utility is to have our costs covered. The council's policy choice is how to, is how to attribute those costs. Uh, uniformity of rates is important to us, but in terms of the policy question, as rates are set up, would be, uh, would be given to the council at that appropriate time. But for discussion related to the economic development, uh, we recommended to not engage in that conversation at this point. I think it's a very good comment. Um, one of the other elements in here has to do with park impact fees, and mm -hmm. it's basically said in here that the park impact fee needs to be reviewed at a policy level and also in the final dollar amount level, but we'll do that in the parks committee in a separate process. I, I guess what you would hope for and suggest is that the council's public works committee retake up the SDCs and look at that and, and have that discussion at that moment. Does that that would be my right. preference, yeah. So, Eric, to try to finish that up, was there, was there any expectation that the SDCs would come forward to the council any time in the next year? Is that on anyone's work plan? We, we, when we did the rate study adjustments in 2012, there was some discussion about the, the, uh, the fees for the SDC charges, and there was some recommendations associated with adjusting those, not, not changing the basic framework, but getting them onto a level playing field. And the distribution of, of, of what portion of that revenue stream is attributed to the SDCs. Uh, we are somewhat waiting for this discussion to be resolved so we can move that, that forward, but the closer we get to 2017, we may just wait for that and have that be as part of the next rate study as well. There, there's not much of a driver financially to make that change um, when it comes to the revenue. I'd like to get this discussion back to the topic, but I would suggest, Jack, maybe under new business tonight or later today, we could bring this up. Okay, yeah. so Fine. the discussion has to do at this point with what a qualifying project is. Qualifying, you have to be in an urban village and you're suggesting some other qualifications and you were trying to finish that up before we go back to one of the other qualifications which has to do with sun setting and first come, first serve basis. Um, so given that's our topic, does the committee have any feedback or comments on qualifying projects and uh, the minimum of three stories or if you are part of a multifamily tax exemption or special valuation program. Roxanne. How would you determine what other sections of the community would receive these benefits in the future? Uh, um, are you talking about? Right now it's downtown and old town. Right. We're right. going to want this to expand in the future. How will we make those determinations over which areas we should go with? That's where I think we um, really need to develop this idea of um, performance measures. And I, I'm anticipating that we'll want to revisit council on some sort of regular basis with those performance measures, not only to report on who um, or what types of projects are utilizing the incentives we end up developing, but also the general health and evolution of our adopted urban villages. So. I think, I think that's the route that we're going to want to go with it is, is seeing what the needs are and then what tools we have and the tools are going to evolve too. So I think we're going to need um, a, a regular check-in on Great. that. Thank you. Yeah. Terry? Yeah, I think Roxanne partly will answer your question. I think one of the reasons we're looking at incentives at all in these different areas is because we have decided that this is where we want growth to go. This is where we want new people. This is a, and by doing so, we're deciding that this is a benefit because by putting growth there, it benefits community as a whole in the sense that we're not going to put it in other neighborhoods. We're not going to do this. This is where we want it. We're not going to put it out in the county. So it's a common benefit kind of thing. And I think for later, in terms of deciding where we put those incentives, it will be the council again to look at how do we, can we offer incentives to induce growth in those areas that we think are really important. And so I think, you know, for me, that's what I look at with that. So Darby, in the memo, when you uh, suggest, the staff suggests that these incentives should be applied as long as performance measures indicate. Were you proposing that when this is enacted or we adopt this, that, that we specify a formal annual review process that maybe does come back to the council and at that time we could either keep it as is or, do, or as Roxanne suggests, maybe that we change it at that point, we decide to expand it or not. How are you imagining that this review occurs? Well, each, we're, we're proposing a number of different things, so there isn't gonna be one council action that says 
here's the whole package. So as far as formal, I, I think we should come back on an annual basis. Um, as far as the SDCs and the permit fee, and we have kind of packaged those two up together because we're offering a, a, what we'd like to do is offer a 50% kind of discount um, we do need to establish some level of predictability for the developers because what we're trying to do is get them to decide, yes, I want to invest here. You have to allow them enough time to actually find that property, to acquire it, to design it, and with enough certainty that it will be in place. And that's why we're proposing a five-year. So I think we, we should create that predictability for the five-year period for downtown and old town. Looking and then, then, you, then we can look at changing it if it if it's not working. Roxanne, do you have more comments? Okay. So I still think we haven't quite got closure yet on the idea of limiting and sunsets. Is there a general reaction to the idea of putting in a numeric cap for the, the the fee and the SDC discounts and kind of a more performance based? Um, sunsetting on some of the other incentives? Is there a general reaction to the staff's proposal? I, I'm Did actually he? pretty good with um, everything that's been proposed. I do have one quick question around Barclay. And I know there's lots of notes in here about things that went around Barclay. Um, but I'm just looking at the matrix sheet. And the really the only thing that's qualifying under Barclay is multifamily tax exemptions. Um, so that's not one of our highlight areas. Is that because we feel that there is a very strong commercial element to that, so we're just encouraging um, residential uh, development? Is um, I, I wouldn't want to say that we're not encouraging commercial development there because yeah. um, we think, <laughs> and I talked about this a little bit in the presentation for Berkeley and Fairhaven, um, is that they've had really robust commercial growth there and they're doing well in that respect and we want to um, make, you know, we want to help them do better. Mm -hmm. But um, we have such limited resources for some of the commercial incentives um, and we want to be really targeted with those. And we, we believe that they're going to continue to have that success with their development regardless of whether we propose incentives. Um, the residential market in Berkeley is emerging. It's mm -hmm. doing really well. Um, the proposal that we've outlined before you is to expand the multifamily tax exemption for um, affordable low-income housing mm -hmm. as defined by the state. Um, because that is something that we don't believe might happen without having that incentive there. Yeah, I, so. I, I would like to encourage more resident um, building over there. <laughs> so that's definitely and, a and one thing that might not be totally clear in the matrix that we have had discussions um, with the Barclay company is um, that as um, pl new plans are adopted, there are opportunities for things like density bonuses and reduced parking requirements and that sort of thing. So um, we've made sure that they're aware of those opportunities and um, so I wanted to make sure you were too. Pinky? Uh, one more curiosity in regards to, uh, you. I know how much work you've been putting into this, so thank you. I'm just curious what kind of conversations would have happened with our finance department on what kind of impacts this would be to our city. Uh, Brian Henshaw was one of our, the members of our team, so we met, I don't know how many times, too many to count. Um, we've had really robust discussions internally. Um, this, this threshold, this 200 to $250,000 threshold was something that we actually were looking um, at the increases, um, of the tax revenue increases off the SDCs, the water and sewer fees, kind of on an annual basis. It's, they're kind of roughly increasing at about that rate. So that's kind of where we came up with and started discussing and then the mayor landed on kind of that that dollar amount as being something that it was reasonable and not wanting to get too much higher, which is again why we can't apply um, this incentive throughout all of the urban villages. 
Okay, well, I'm going to say with regard to the, the, the sun setting and the cap, I think those are reasonable ways of limiting it in terms of time as well as, of course, the geographic limitations. So we'll go on maybe the next one, which is Barclay related, or one of the things, it has to do with boundaries. And you clarified in the memo, for example, that when we say waterfront, we really just mean the downtown portion. But you do say something here which I think I disagree with, that you want to align the incentives in Barclay with the TIF reduction boundary. I actually have a problem with Barclay's TIF reduction boundary. I, I think that the rationale for TIF reduction has to do with internal trip capture and a quarter mile walking radius. And there's a portion of Barclay that's up a hill and outside the urban village area. And so I would actually shrink the Barclay designation that's eligible for, for TIF. And then I wouldn't have a problem with overlapping these new incentives with that one. So with Barclay, um, and, we're, and we're just trying to align in this case for simplicity's sake, um, remember the, the only incentive that we're recommending at this time is the multifamily tax exemption for um, affordable housing. So it's naturally, it's not gonna be allowed where housing's not allowed, and multifamily tax exemption only um, qualifies if you have four or more units. So it's not gonna qualify for, so we think with zoning and the multifamily tax exemption re requirements, it's gonna land in, in the right places anyways. But we can throw that, that map up for discussion if, if you would yeah, like. I mean, my personal opinion is that we're trying to be targeted and we're trying to promote denser urban development, development, you know, outside of single family areas in areas where we want density. And the map for Barclay was created, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago with a different purpose in mind. And I guess it's areas like 26 and 22 and even area two, those aren't urban village areas. So the area that um, the TIF applies to is it's outlined in red. Okay. So it might be smaller already than what you're thinking. So 17. Um, Maybe it's area 20. What is area 20? What? I'm trying to orient. Where, could you point to Woburn? Can you, to Woburn? I'm not very familiar with that maps. Oh, you're right. Michael, you're right, the 20 goes up the hill because the curve there is Barkley winding up the hill. Yeah, so that's a, I, I think that Hagen is probably in area 19 or 18. Yep. It's um, down from 20 is not a walkable is where distance. 16 is differentiated from 18 and 19. Okay, there you go. I just don't think that's in an urban village. I don't think we should be targeting incentives there. That's my personal opinion on TIFs and it would be the same with uh, affordable multifamily. One person's opinion. Um, I'm gonna recognize Pinky. I'm okay with it as is. So I, I differ in that thought. Um, I think that uh, Barclay is growing. It is most definitely an urban village and the more ways that we can encourage um, low income housing development, I'm all for it. Councilmember Weiss? I would define Barclay as a suburban town center right now that's strictly commercial, uh, that wants to now, uh, because of I think some, some criticisms, try and get some, some residential in there. Uh, you know, let's, let's be really clear about the fact that a lot of the development that's happened in, in Barclay has, has only been commercial up until just uh, in 2007 when they threw a few dozen units together right before the recession. They, were, they had a hard time going even selling those, those residential units and now they've put in a little over 100 unit uh, s structure. But you know, you go back to the comprehensive plan, they're supposed to, at a minimum, they're supposed to have 476 units as part of their overall development. They've developed a lot of their commercial already, but they haven't done very much in the way of residential. They're supposed to be, you know, up to 1,300 units of, of residential housing was supposed to be part of that agreement that was, that was done in 1970, or 1995. Um, I have a real problem with trying to incentivize them any more than, than they already have been uh, through previous council actions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't believe that the TIF credit should be part of Barclay at all. 
we look at a perfect example is is the uh, the theater complex. We had 15 movie theaters in in the community that were shut down in order to build 16 at at Barclay. Uh, Not 15, six. No, we had six, six, and three, 15. Wait a minute, we had six was Sunset. Sunset. We had Bellis Fair that shut down, and we had Sea Home that shut down. All three of those were on principal arterials. This, this doesn't, you know, this isn't part of a, a principal arterial type. You don't of, think Barclay and Woolburn are arterials? They're not according to our <laughs> comp plan. They're not according to. I'll so save the, mine the reason, you guys Gene, the that. reason why I'm bringing this up is that we gave a seventy-one thousand dollar credit to the developers and uh, of the movie complex because it was supposed to go and not create traffic. Tell me that that uh, how many people that are using those theaters right now are not using the bus or walking as part of an urban village. They I walk. have a real problem with the fact that we subsidize them to the tune of $71,000, uh, you know, when we're trying to scrap, scrap money for, uh, you know, for anything for these other areas that we really would like to have development. To me, Residential development in Barclay should be the number one goal for, for the Barclay Corporation, mm -hmm. and they should be doing it. Uh, and they have the obligations according to the comp plan. And I, I, for us to go and incentivize it, I, I just don't support that. So I saw a number of hands. I'm going to recognize Pinky, then Roxanne, then Jean. Uh, I'm not going to speak for the Barclay Corporation, I, but I will say that I have been. Um, uh, have seen their plans for many, many years, and I know that there were lots of challenges for them to build residential in regards to um, our economy not not that not working and not being able to be funded. So they are they appear to be putting as as many steps forward in building residential and making it more of an urban village. And and I would like to encourage them to do so. So, but again, um, Barclay can speak for themselves, but. Uh, I know that their rental, when their cornerstone building went up, um, that within 20 days the entire place was rented. And so the need is there, people want to live there, so uh, I think it's part of our responsibility to try and encourage housing there. Roxanne? I want to bring it back to where we're supposed to be right now, which is looking at incentives for downtown and old town. And I'd just like to say the, pro the direction I'd like to provide is I support these different incentives. That's all. <laughs> Gene? It is a fact that I, I really don't understand after all these years now that we're not calling Barclay Village bar of, of Urban Village. I live there. I walk to the grocery store. I walk to the doctor. I walk to the dentist. People are walking up and down. Barclay all the time. I want to remind everybody the Barclay company paid 5.9 million for Barclay Boulevard. They paid 4.5 million for Woolburn. All on their all on their back. And there's grocery store there, there is retail. I will agree that it is time for homes and dwellings to be built on that property. And I think they do too. I have absolutely no relationship with any decision making with that company. They're a subsidiary of uh, our company that I work for, but I have no conversations with them. They stay totally away from me. We don't discuss anything that has to do with Barclay Village. But I, I, it is an, I, if it isn't an urban village, then I don't know what is an urban village because everything is there now. They have, yes, there's a lot of commercial there, but there's dentists and doctors and lawyers and all sorts of different stuff there. So I, I don't know, but I, I just think that, uh, it is an urban village, and I think we need to call it what it is. So I'm going to say something. Opinion. I'll recognize Terry. To me, what doesn't feel urban village like about Barclay is that there's very little mixed use development. So there are there's housing nearby, all that commerce, but they're not really in the same place in the same building, which is the pattern that I, we're promoting in downtown, it's a matter of we're, pattern we're promoting in our urban villages where the, the uses are actually mixed in the same block rather than nearby. It's why it feels like it has a different character to me. But, uh, you know, I wasn't talking about the core, which I was talking about the, the periphery. Terry. Yeah, you know, I kind of have to agree. In the past, it didn't feel like the urban village because of the lack of housing. But as they're moving into the new phase, where they are developing housing and have housing, if we, and I agree we shouldn't provide at this t 
time we don't need to provide incentives for the commercial development because that's happening. But one of the things I hear all the way through here, whether it's Jack saying it's not an urban village, it's because there's not enough housing. Michael, it's not an urban village because there's not enough housing. If we're providing incentives, it should be for housing because that's what we're, everyone here is saying that whether you want to call it a village or not, is this should be the place where we want additional housing. So we want density bonuses and other kinds of things to increase the amount of housing. This is where we sh it should have housing. So when we're looking at it in terms of getting housing there, if we're going to provide incentives, have it be for the housing because we want them to in incorporate housing in there. And I'd also love to see it incorporated in terms of you know affordable housing within that mix because it it meets the other definitions of being able to walk for all the amenities which most of our other urban villages don't have. So Jack. That's, that's my two cents on it. Two cents now to Jack. I have two points. One is that if you look at an aerial photograph of the Bar Barkley area, you can't tell me that that's an urban village when you see the amount of asphalt that's laid down on that ground. Um, and you compare that to downtown or any other other ones that even Samish has got minimal amount of uh, asphalt compared to the parking lots that we have scattered all over Barkley. Uh, it is not an urban village. Um, and the second thing, to, you know, to the point of the residential part, it, I don't think we need to give them incentives because it was it was part of an agreement. They would build a minimum of 476 homes in exchange for all the commercial development. They didn't need to have incentives to go and take a lot of the financial district uh, operations out of the downtown area and relocate them to the, to the Barclay area. Uh, they didn't need incentives for that, but they did it anyway, and they're doing quite well financially, and they're prospering that way. I think we need to really look at that and say, how much more incentive do we need to give to that particular area? They should be building that residential on their own dime because they profited from the commercial side of it. That's all I'm saying. And, I, you know, we can move on to other things because this, this really is not part of the conversation I think staff wants to have. So in the memo, number four did refer to Barclay. Have we touched on what the staff is recommending or not recommending with regard to Barclay? Can we summarize that? Uh, so a summary of what isn't isn't being recommended in Barclay. Um, the recommendation is to extend the multifamily tax exemption program to the portion of Barclay um, that the TIF credit currently applies to for affordable housing for low income. Okay. Um, the other recommendation is um, to be determined based on the park impact fee discussion, whether or not there's opportunity to reduce park impact fee, there is, um, is still up for discussion based on that broader topic. Um, to continue to apply the TIF reduction credit program, to offer expedited permitting and bin bump up, which we're um, proposing for all the urban villages, and then to also consider density bonuses and reduce parking should um, we move forward with uh, adoption of an urban village plan. So the last one would only be available if Barclay went through another planning process, but the others would apply to all of them, including Barclay. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion from the committee on that particular item? Jack, then we'll go on. I would remove all my, my uh, criticisms of the Barclay area if they went through another master planning process and brought their master plan to the same levels that the ones that have recently been done in the city. I think that that would be a very fair, they, they did a 1.0 plan, we, you know, we're up into 2.0 or 3.0 versions of, of what an urban village master plan might look like. And I think if they went and redid theirs, uh, you know, we could put them on par with all the other ones. Right now I feel like what's going on is an unfair uh, advantage to them at the expense of the other urban villages. Well, Barclay was created before any of this and I think that's why it seems to be right. a debate about how well it fits and whether it fits. 
We'll go on to the next item, which has to do with the B&O tax credit, which is one more incentive. And this is also restricted. Can you describe this one and your recommendations? Uh, the B&O tax credit proposal would be a um, credit offered to new businesses in the targeted urban villages of the city center. So that's Old Town, Downtown, and Waterfront. Fountain District, and then staff has amended um, our recommendation to include Samish Way as well. Um, the tax credit that we're proposing for discussion would be 100% credit for the first year of business, um, which would be no tax that year, 75% credit the second year, and 50% credit the third year. Um, this could be for new construction as well as filling vacancies in existing buildings. Um, one important uh, item of note is that this would be offered um, to businesses that relocate, uh, would not be offered, sorry, would not be offered to businesses that relocate from elsewhere in the city. It would be businesses that are new to Bellingham or a new branch of an existing bu uh, business. We don't want to incentivize moving businesses from elsewhere just to um, incentivize new ones. Um, there is also some discussion in the staff recommendation here about the idea of setting a, a two-story limit on the, the either new construction or existing buildings. We'd be interested in your feedback on that. That was in response to the idea of not wanting to facilitate the auto-oriented low-scale development. Um, on the other hand, business activity is a good thing no matter what in these targeted areas. So we're open um, and would really appreciate your feedback on that idea. So this would be the um, tax break for new businesses, truly new businesses or truly new branches, but you also want to, and in urban villages, you want to add a third thing, which is you've got to be moving into a rehabbing, at least a two-story tall building. Is that yeah. a summary? Yeah, either new construction or existing. Um, I'm okay with the B&O you know, tax credit recommendations, but I honestly, I don't feel as though I understand the concept of the two-story part to make comment on that particular portion, but the rather recommendations I think are great. I'll, I'll give an example of why we, why we developed that um, proposal, at least for discussion purposes. Um, we went away from the last meeting with you kind of revisiting Samish Way and um, why we were um, not proposing the B&O tax um, proposal for that, that district. And the reason for it is because, why we hadn't, is because Samish Way is actually um, full of businesses. What it's lacking is the density, it's lacking the the mixed use or the taller buildings. Um, and so, um, and there's nothing, Walgreens, for example. Walgreens, great. Um, I think it's gonna be great for the neighborhood, but, um, and, and it's great to see that investment there, but does Walgreens, is that what we were, and that's not really what we were after in, as far as redeveloping our urban villages. We're after Walgreens plus, plus more. Um, so that's where, we're, and we're still kind of in discussion mode on that, but that's why we're thinking, well, well, maybe if Walgreens did go into a building with something else mixed in there, um, and so that's where, where we're at with that. Terry? Yeah, I, I kind of like the idea of, of the two-story, but it's, it's Samish, but it's not just the Samish area. When we're looking at the concept of urban villages and density, the you putting in additional one-story buildings in our downtown is a not a good land use putting new ones into the urban village area in old town is not a good use of valuable lands and when, especially when we're looking at the concept of urban villages you know the urban village isn't a whole bunch of single-story buildings it's it is looking at higher density and a little bit of height, and that's what we're trying to encourage. So for providing incentives, yeah, I want any kind of new businesses going on down in Samish, but I would, if we're gonna provide the, the incentives, and I've pushed for the, the B&O down in there, I think it, it makes sense to 
incentivize that which we would like to see built rather than just putting it out there. I'm going to recognize Dan next. I'm just wondering if there's any way to predict what the financial impact might be for this 100% uh, first year credit and what the, that cascading uh, number, what that could look like, if, if, if there's any way that we can know that. Uh, we can revisit that with Brian Henshaw. Uh, he had indicated it would be a pretty tough um, estimate or guesstimate um, and, and was not able to do that for us, but we can revisit that idea with him. Uh, go ahead, Dan. I'm wondering what the, the threshold for a new business is. Does that mean a business that's been in business less than a year, or does it have to be an absolutely new business that it just incorporated? Yeah, um, we're going to have to, if, if you want us to move forward with this um, item, we're going to have to spend more time, w again, with Brian developing how this would be administered because the tracking part could get really tricky. But the intent is that it would be either a business that's completely new to Bellingham. So when they're applying for that, that first business registration, we would look, we would track it. Or if it's an existing business that's not relocating, but perhaps opening a franchise, or a new branch in that urban village location, and we'd want to offer it to those types of new businesses as well. But the idea would be that it would be their first year of operation that they would be eligible for that 100% tax credit. So they could have been in business for 20 years, but if they open up a new branch or they move from another community, it's new to us. Right. And I think I saw Jack, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Jack? Um, Speaking to the two-story issue, and this more has more to do with all of our urban villages, to, you know, it seems in retrospect that we might have made a, um, uh, an omission in our urban, urban village master plans in that we didn't provide a, ceil or a floor for our building height. We, you know, some of them, some of the plans we have ceilings, like for, you know, Fairhaven, we have all these ceilings that we talked about. We, we never talked about a floor. How difficult, you guys have done master plans on your own, but if we did like a blanket uh, revisit of all of our master plans and was able to go and stick in a two or a three story floor, how difficult would that be process wise outside of, you know, a one or two year uh, in endeavor? Well, I think process wise, um, it, it may not be too difficult, but um, we really want to think carefully. I think um, putting, putting, uh, Bellingham is not downtown Seattle. <laughs> we are, we are still a market that is, is quite small and we are, you know, what we're all after here is trying to get to the urban village, but not every property owner, not every developer, not every business owner is interested in or capable of building a five million dollar, um, mixed-use building that we see in, in downtown and so um, I, I don't even I wouldn't even like to see that probably in downtown which is our densest um, urban village because I think it would it would actually probably do what it could do something in reverse which is limit any any investment going into downtown that would be a maybe a different project I mm -hmm. think than this Personally, um, I, I think my sentiments are directly aligned with what, what Terry was saying, which is that if we're going to be using an incentive, I mean, you can build a one-story tall building, Walgreens did, but if we're going to be offering you an incentive, then we need a, a two-story uh, tall building. Otherwise, you are indeed under underbuilding. Um, we are going for uh, density. And so I, I, I'm personally in support of adding that, that two-story requirement on there. Otherwise, we're, it's not an urban village at all. It's just, it's, it's just another commercial development. So that's my feedback. Um, we are maybe about two-thirds of the way through this discussion. We have another item. Uh, it looks like we may need to continue this. If there's any continued discussion that we've talked about already, I think we should keep going, but maybe not, not get to the end of the discussion today. Does that sound fair, committee? Pinky? Oh, I just wanted to say 
all over. I'm, I'm very supportive of all the things that have come forth. I think that you've done a really great job of being very comprehensive and doing your research and seeing what's going to work in our city. Um, we can continue the subject, but I'm good with all the things that are in front of us. Second. Uh, in general, I'm actually in favor of what has been recommended here, except for the Barclay boundaries. Um, so from the committee, I think you, you've, we've got a, a, a greenish light for the two-thirds we need to go through. Um, so, Council President, shall we? Yeah, just I think we better move on. we got one more item, and it's scheduled for 15 minutes. Okay. So to give them so, the time that they deserve. Thank you very much. We'll continue that discussion later. Hopefully you've got enough feedback to at least move forward in some of those items. Thank you. So the last item for Planning Community Development Committee today is a presentation of an economic of a study on the economic contribution of outdoor education to our local economy. This was a study which was funded with a small gift uh, from the city as well as from the county and as well as from the port and participation with the Tourism Commission, but really was prepared for Recreation Northwest and who we have presenting here is the Director of Recreation Northwest, Mr. Todd Ellsworth, and I also see April Claxton here with Recreation Northwest. Any further introduction you'd like, Todd? No, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so I'll just read the summary statement. The presentation will provide a synopsis of the newly released economic contribution of outdoor recreation study. The study provides a detailed analysis of the economic impact of outdoor recreation related to expenditures and describes the benefit of recreational lands in Whatcom County. Thank you, Michael. Can you all hear me? Yep. Uh, again, my name is Todd Ellsworth. I'm the Executive Director of Recreation Northwest. Uh, our signature event is the Bellingham Traverse, and two years ago we incorporated it as a nonprofit, and we're excited to be expanding into new things. Uh, this is a big leap for us and really for our community, and so thank you uh, as funders, and thank you, Mayor Linville, for helping us put this together and Tara for your support as well. Um, in, a, in a bigger perspective of this, you'll see Earth Economics up on the screen here and, and they're the firm out of Tacoma that prepared the report. They did one for the state uh, that came out of Senator Ranker's urging and the Recreation and Conservation Office in Olympia. Uh, so we're delighted to be able to share the results of this study with you and, and I'll turn it over to April. So this study really focused on three areas. It focused on the recreation expenditures from people playing outside, focused on the recreation businesses that are based here in the county and in the city, and then it focused on the additional benefits that we receive from having those recreation lands. And we'll come back to all these numbers so you don't have to look at them all, catch them all the first time around. Um, the first area that they really looked at was the economic expenditures by both residents and visitors. In the study, we did not differentiate between the two. It's anybody that's outside, whether they're boating, skiing, hiking, mountain biking, uh, and it includes all purchases related to those recreation opportunities, so the gas to get to the trailhead, the beer afterwards, the lodging if you live here, uh, or if you are visiting, sorry, and your equipment is one of the biggest, bigger expenditures. Uh, in their analysis, they looked at how that spending flows throughout the county, so it's that direct spending. It's also then the businesses receiving that money in their secondary supply chain service spending and the wages paying to their employees. No big surprise, uh, but the, when you compare to the state average, Whatcom County ranks highly. We're a very active county. Uh, across the state, people average about 59 days per year that they're outside playing, and in Whatcom County, it's 78 days. And we just have a nice, uh, we've talked to, in our work, lots of various professionals, not necessarily directly, directly recreation tied, but who have chosen to either move or live here because they enjoy all the amenities. That's Kathy Herndon from VSHCPAs. 
So all told, when you look at all of that spending in all the various, and in this case there were 40 different recreational opportunities that were looked at, it was $705 million spent annually. It's eighth highest in the state and boating expenditures, whether it's in or on public waters, were the highest at 132 million. And then on the flip side, the businesses receiving the most, the majority of the, or not the majority, but the highest uh, number of those expenditures were our food and drink establishments. When, especially on equipment, some of these, some of this money is leaving the county. So when you account for the economic, the direct economic contribution, how much of that 705 stays in the county, that was 500 and 585 million dollars, and that actually bumps us up to sixth highest in the state. And that spending supports just over 6,500 jobs. So the second area that Earth Economics looked at, and this is actually their specialty, um, is bringing a new angle to it and looking at some of the broader non-direct spending benefits that we have by having these recreation lands available. And for this study, they looked at three specific areas. They looked at habitat, water quality, and the, the decreased amount we have to spend on built treatment systems, and then aesthetics. And one of the ways to quantify aesthetics is that increase in property values you find for properties that are on or near the water or near a park. And combining those added benefits, uh, they tallied between six and ten billion dollars in additional non-market benefits from the 755 hundred 755,000 acres we have of public land in the county. One of the areas that we were most excited to dive into is recreation businesses specifically. The ecosystem services and the consumer spending has been done in other studies. Um, but we really knew that that did, wasn't necessarily accounting for all the recreation businesses that we have in the county. Um, consumer spending might hit the retail shops, but it's also really looking at the breweries, the hotels, uh, <laughs> but not necessarily taking into account the, manuf the recreation manufacturers or adventure publications, some of the tours, other facilities that are based here because of the recreation opportunities we have but aren't necessarily tied directly to spending. So we really worked with our Earth Economics to figure out a way to quantify that and they also looked at the direct annual revenues from those businesses and then again the secondary spending from those businesses and B2B spending and employee wages. And we have a couple examples of some of those, those hidden businesses. Uh, one is McNett Corporation. They've been here for over 30 years, as you can read up there. Uh, they make gear repair products and really are based here in large part because of the value this being in this place provides to their employees. And then Canfield Brothers is the example of one of the types of businesses we're excited about, a small recreation manufacturer that specifically chose to move here because of the access to mountain biking and the access to the mountain biking community. Uh, and it was businesses like this, they're hard to quantify because there is no recreation business sector. They're hiding in manufacturers, they're hiding in retailers, they're hiding in publishing. Um, Adventures Northwest, Mount Baker Experience, some of the other ones, Superfeet, Kona Bikes. There's a lot, a lot of examples tucked in out there. So when we went through with Earth Economics and tallied 279, recreation related businesses in the county that have 508 million dollars in revenue and are supporting 3,728 jobs. Thank you April. <coughs> so that's awesome. Uh, we finally have some numbers to to show the value of recreation in Whatcom County and and really in the short term we're looking at this as a benchmark. We, we've never had these numbers before. Uh, I think that they would have been valuable in the county conversation we had around the reconveyance. Uh, it was a lot of emotion-based opinion testimony, 
and now we have some numbers to put down. Um, my hope and, and our hope is that we look to do this again in five years and see how far we've grown uh, this valuable sector of our economy. And then also beyond just Whatcom County, we're really looking to use this study to demonstrate how we see this as a core value and make the recreation economy part of our economic development vernacular and language and really empowering decisions around having to be a driving force in our community. Uh, one thing that I've worked for years to do is really help highlight this as the recreation capital of the Northwest. And so now we have a study and some numbers uh, to, that, that complements a statewide study. It really positions us well, uh, and we're really excited about that. So thank you for your time. If we have, we have time for questions. Sure, uh, let, me, yeah. let me start off, Todd. Um, this was a, a Whatcom specific study, but Earth Economics did a Washington State study as well. Can you just briefly summarize that? Briefly? Yes. <laughs> Briefly. Uh, I'll have to pull, f I left it. Um, so uh, do, you, do you have those numbers in your head? Um, was it good news? I, it was good news. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it's, it's in the millions and billions of dollars. Um, and really, their core competency is providing a value for our open space and public land. Uh, their name, Earth Economics, speaks to that. Um, and so it's, it's interesting and exciting to demonstrate the value of leaving the trees in the ground and having healthy, clean water because it provides a place for us to go recreate. Um, the, the numbers, all, all this is available on our website, uh, the full PDF of the report, and we also have links to the state study uh, for relevance in uh, how we stack up statewide. Uh, the one thing that April identified was that how this is different than the state study is we really dove into, uh, with the leadership of our funders, uh, getting more information about the recreation business economy that we have in Whatcom County. Right, so there's yeah. three pieces and it was that yeah. third piece. Whereas the state study covered more like two, okay. if you will. Yep. Committee members, Pinky? Uh, this was a really interesting report to read and I encourage people to take a look at it because there's a lot of fantastic information about Whatcom County in this. Um, and you know, I, I'm really glad that this report happened because it's always been anecdotal around what our economic impact is and how recreation enhances that. Uh, but this is metrics and this proves the economic impact. And so I, I think this was a great idea and thank you very much for sharing this information with us. And the report is on the uh, city's website under the council pack materials. Roxanne? Well, now that I don't get to recreate nearly as much oh. since I sit up here so often, <laughs> I've been thinking about this every time. I've been hiking up trails, riding my bike around town, going to the bike shop, seeing all the different businesses that are developing here from mountain biking, and then everybody having fun after ski to see with me. You know, all these things add up, and you just create a great business sense for why we need to support this section of our community. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, and that's, and it's interesting because really I, I see this as a way uh, to help empower your decision making on stuff that's coming up as far as park acquisitions and greenways levies and stuff like that, which fortunately are very popular um, and I think will continue to be, uh, and this helps highlight that. Uh, the other thing that I'll encourage all of you though also is uh, we're hoping back to the benchmark again in five years to do this again. What more do we want to know? I know that you want to know more about everything. So. Uh, everything, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, so, and so what gaps and what information do we want to look at uh, as we move forward as a community with regards to recreation and, and how can we have data backing up our decisions? Terry? Yeah, I thank you for this report. This is, this is really good, really good. I think one thing that's not in here because I don't know exactly how you measure it is in addition to companies that are here that uh, make recreation equipment or whatever, I've run into a number of different people that have moved their companies, consulting or whatever, small business here because of the recreational 
activities. There are a lot of people who, have, who retire here with good disposable income, retire here because of the recreational opportunities, the boating, the skiing, the hiking opportunities. So it's not just those, but that other adds to this uh, a recreational economy. You know, I mean, it's, just, it's, it's a draw for, for young startup people, you know, starting uh, different businesses that want to come here because of the Galbraith uh, mountain biking or, or just so many different areas. So it, I think it's, some of these numbers are even higher when you uh, roll in some of the, those other factors. But thank you. Yep. Thank you. So, Todd, I have a question that you probably can't answer it, but um, it has to do with uh, it has to do with our, our, our visitor and tourism-related industry, and the estimate there is that's a five hundred and fifty million dollar local driver in Whatcom County, and I don't know if we can, someone can, the overlap between visitors, visit visitor industry, which is equally large, and recreation. You said this report didn't separate out visitors. It's for everyone, locals and visitors yeah. combined. Yes. But can you even roughly guess 50-50 or you didn't even try to guess? They separated it. It was separated out for the state study, but we, yeah, it, I, don't, I don't even have a guess for the okay. county study, at least not from the analysis that we did it for this. It may be out there for something else. And also, this was a, a Whatcom County study, not just Bellingham. And I think a kind of a good comparison might be um, farming. This is one of the leading agricultural counties uh, in western Washington. And Farmgate, I think, is north of 350 million. You do the spillovers from Farmgate, it's up to a billion again. That's huge for, the, for Whatcom County. This is equally large. We're a, we're a farming county, we're a recreational county. Those are both true. And art. And art. <laughs> God, he wasn't listening to us a while ago. Huh? It's impressive. Well, I enjoyed the Mayor's Arts Award earlier last week. So. <laughs> Any further discussion on this presentation? Okay. Thank you very much, Todd. Thank April. Much. Thank you. And that is the uh, fourth item of Thank the you, Michael. Committee. We got about four minutes, and then we'll reconvene with the committee.